Hello. Thank you very much for joining us. And good evening or good afternoon, wherever you may be. These are difficult times, terrible times. Many of us in different parts of the world are being forced into some sort of quarantine or self-isolation. And some of us are very lucky that we at least have some of the basic facilities of life in these times of the fear and anxiety of COVID-19 and what it may do. We, whilst we, those of us who have some degree of security, perhaps it's time for us to reflect on what on earth is happening in Palestine. We are very lucky today to be, to have uh, Dr. Hassan Abu Sitta from, uh, join, uh, joining us live from Beirut. And uh, welcome, Hassan. Welcome. Hello. And uh, we'll, uh, we've seen the spread of uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID across the world and the terror that it has unleashed. How is the effect of COVID-19 uh, different in, um, in, in Palestine, amongst Palestinians, and in, uh, how is it different to the rest of the world? So, um, if we want to talk about Palestine, um, we need to talk about the West Bank separately from Gaza. And then we need to talk about the Palestinians so that we include the situation of Palestinian refugees in countries that are now affected by the pandemic. Um, if we start for, with Gaza, as you well know, Gaza is almost hermetically sealed from the rest of the world, with the exception of the uh, border with Egypt through Rafah. That bubble that Gaza was living allowed a delay in the uh, arrival of the pandemic to Gaza, luckily. Um, and then eventually we had two cases that had come of, of Palestinians returning through Rafah, and then seven cases of contacts with these um, uh, two uh, uh, positive patients. Now, before that happened, I think everybody was in a state of absolute terror because we know that the Everything about Gaza means that the result of an infection of this scale that is that contagious uh, reaching Gaza would be absolutely devastating. The idea of social distancing in the world's most densely populated place on earth uh, uh, is ludicrous. The idea of hand washing in a place that almost 30 to 40 percent of households do not have running water is ludicrous. And a siege that has lasted over a decade that has destroyed the uh, local economy, destroyed the health infrastructure, destroyed this water and sewage and sanitation infrastructure means that Gaza once the inevitable happens and it reaches the point where the epidemic is inside Gaza, is going to face an unprecedented human disaster. Nothing about Gaza's situation prepares it for any meaningful uh, 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 way of uh, defending itself against the ravages of this epidemic including something as basic as the number of ventilators. There's probably less than 50 ventilators in Gaza that are probably going to be able to function. And are they working? Um, pardon? Do the ventilators that exist in Gaza work? Well, the, the 50 ones are the ones that we think are either, either work or are fixable at the moment. Um, and then when you look, step back from the ventilators to the number of beds required that have access to uh, uh, oxygen delivery systems, either in form of mask or in form of nasal cannula, uh, the access to uh, the access to health staff 
we've seen how uh, the pro one of the problems of this uh, um, of this pandemic is the attrition rate of health staff as they uh, become infected and have to be quarantined at home uh, to the fact that, that Gaza has not been given enough um, testing kits so that it cannot really, uh, does not have the capacity to screen uh, so as to isolate uh, individuals who are infected. Because really in Gaza, the, the, your only chance in such a heavily populated place, which is effectively... I mean, when you deal with Gaza, is the same, with regards to this pandemic, it's like dealing with the prison system uh, with regards to the pandemic. You need, you can't isolate people, so what you need to do is screen and then isolate those who come back as positive. So Ga Gaza has neither been given the tools to prophylactically screen and isolate or the infrastructure to treat once the infection becomes symptomatic. What, On the other hand, yeah, go ahead. What has what are the Israeli policies uh, with regards uh, containment of uh, COVID nineteen? And in, in, in I mean, we've heard stories, for example, of people being uh, dropped in front of checkpoints. So what happens in the West Bank is that there's around. 100 to 200,000 Palestinians daily Palestinian day laborers who have to cross the apartheid wall every day to go and work inside uh, the green line uh, these are now if they test positive or show any signs of uh, being infected are literally dumped on the other side of the wall uh, with no recourse to any kind of medical treatment. Uh, the impoverishment of Palestinians, the way that the economy of the West Bank was reconfigured so that um, Palestinians have to work in Israeli settlement means that um, these laborers, despite the fact that all of them are worried about bringing back uh, 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 the infection to their families still have to travel. And so the cases that have been positive in the West Bank, by and large, have been the families of laborers who have to go every day to the other side of the apartheid rule. To go back to Gaza again for a little while, and we come back to the West Bank, how, what sort of scenarios are we looking at? What's one of the worst scenarios that we can look at in, in terms of the spread of COVID-19 and its potential impact both on economic and human life? So the, the, the worst case scenario is if you get 80 to 90 percent infection rate in a place as uh, densely populated as Gaza, uh, which means that your whole health system, which is around 3,000 beds will be completely overwhelmed. Certainly your intensive care uh, 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 and ventilator capacity will be very quickly overwhelmed. We know that patients on average stay on the ventilators for 10 to 14 days. So that means that, that really early on you'll overwhelm your system. And uh, really the, the, the loss of life will be absolutely catastrophic. Because even if uh, uh, two million, uh, let's say 80% of the two million uh, uh, get uh, um, uh, infected, and then the mortality rate now lies somewhere between three and a half and eight, let's say it lies at five, that is a lot of people who will lose their life as a result of this infection. And uh, given this dire situation that's evolving uh, in front of us, how is the constant Israeli bombardment and physical assaults on Gaza accentuating this problem? So last night there was a, a bombardment uh, of uh, uh, Gaza. Uh, not just that, the Israelis have refused to allow medical teams from humanitarian organizations to enter 
uh, into Gaza through Ares. The Israelis, having procured 100,000 testing kits for COVID, uh, allowed 200 to enter into Gaza. They are refusing to allow medical equipment and medical disposables in the form of personal protective equipment to enter Gaza. Uh, and uh, um, have not allowed, despite this the drop in international oil prices, have not en allowed enough uh, um, diesel to get into Gaza to have to increase the number of, of hours that people have electricity uh, uh, supplies to their houses, and which would therefore improve uh, the water and sanitation uh, uh, plants in Gaza. So we have a situation where there is the spread of a, a deadly virus. We have a situation, the lack of testing kits. We have a situation where there are almost daily bombardments. To what extent does this uh, demonstrate the Israeli apartheid as a state, as a state of mind, where this uh, one life is worth very different to another life. So I think it's even more uh, insidious than this. I think the Israelis see this as an opportunity to break uh, uh, Gaza without having to uh, to without having to. Uh, use much in the way of, of force and are setting up the conditions for the perfect storm in Gaza in terms of this virus, in terms of the lack of infrastructure and in terms of hermetically sealing it, i.e. you let it inside and then you close the door and then you let it burn uh, inside until there's nothing left to burn. Really? It's a dreadful situation that uh, you're painting. Now, we you mentioned earlier on about how Israelis are dumping day laborers in uh, on the borders of uh, you know on on the outskirts of West Bank, and how that has now led to the spread within uh, different areas. How is the Palestinian Authority doing? What's what is it doing? And is there anything it can actually do? You see, what this pandemic has has exposed, not just within Palestine, but globally, is where real sovereignty lies. And of course, the Palestine Authority has absolutely zero sovereignty over uh, the West Bank. And so despite its attempts that within the bantustans of the uh, West Bank, it was able to enforce a lockdown, it has uh, zero ability to uh, control the movement of laborers across the apartheid wall and the movement of Israeli soldiers who, whose incursions have continued into the West Bank. There was a, there was a, 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 um, a CCTV video yesterday uh, showing an Israeli patrol in Hebron and it was clearly showing, the, 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 the cameras captured clearly uh, an Israeli soldier spitting at the cars and the car handles as he walked through. Uh, and so it's obvious that the Palestine Authority is doing whatever little it has in terms of the sovereignty that it has, but it has very little sovereignty. In a way, the what does it say of the mindset of the Zionist mindset that you create a, a sort of a, 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 a servant group of people who look after your occupied zones, and uh, then you create a, a setup where you're protecting one particular group of people? What does it say about the Zionist uh, mindset? Uh. It shows that it really this is a genocidal uh, project because the closest we have historically is the creation of reservations for um, Native Americans. And then the way that the American authorities used to collect the uh, blankets from uh, uh, chickenpox patients and take these blankets into the uh, uh, um, read into the Native American reservations as a way of wiping out 
the the Native Americans. It's the same genocidal tendency with with the limitations of using apartheid as a method. The Israeli capital does not need Palestinians uh, 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 and does not view Palestinians as a as a um, uh, as a resource uh, for uh, uh, Israeli capital. It's closer to the American model of a of a colonialist uh, project that has genocidal tendencies. But it does seem, in a way, that there are there's a whole terror amongst Israeli society as well as to what the consequences of the virus can be for them. Do they really believe that they are going to be isolated from the effects of it if they allow the infections to rage within the Palestinians? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Zionist ideology at the moment still believes in the possibility of isolation. I mean, to build the wall in this day and age, to build the wall uh, at the time when uh, uh, non-state actors are able to build drones and missiles and believe in a wall that will se separate you from the indigenous population means that as ludicrous as it is to you and me, this is what they believe. Here in the West, you know, it's hardly a mention on Palestine at all, or the implications of what it can be. Can the treatment really of Palestinians by the Israelis be separated, in your opinion, from the way of this blanket obsession or self-obsession within Western countries? Uh, well, I think the issue the issue is... Uh, with regards to the West, and as we watch the disintegration of liberal, Western liberal political institutions in the form of the EU, in the form of the UN, in the form of NATO, uh, the what will happen? Uh, is, uh, and so, so you have this disintegration, and the reason why there is this disintegration. Uh, uh, particularly amongst European states, is that uh, solidarity as a concept uh, that defines between individuals and between nations uh, is such an anathema to uh, these uh, to to liberal bourgeois uh, Western institutions that. They are of their most need so, to some kind of solidarity, are incapable of showing solidarity towards each other. What they're capable of doing is either uh, towards each other a mutually beneficial relationship in which they manage uh, the resources of the rest of the world, or towards the third world, international aid, which is a domineering uh, uh, relationship between an active player and a passive player. And so we've seen these countries that have basically over the last 30 years tried to uh, occupy the moral high ground with their international solidarity have not been able to show this kind of, of uh, international aid, have not been able to show solidarity because solidarity and aid are two different moral uh, 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 moral f philosophies. One is between equals and is non uh, uh, is not based on benefit, and the other one is based on on uh, on benefit and domination. Indeed, in fact, in uh, the anger of some of the people in Italy against the EU was so much so that in some cases they had reports of taking off the European EU's flag and putting that of uh, China, which at least has been coming forward and providing uh, some degree of support to different countries in the EU. Do you think there's any chance of uh, any support coming to Palestine, Palestine from China or Cuba, which has been going on? I mean, are there any moves at all that could, this could happen and break some of the siege? The siege is under the control of the Israelis and the Americans um, and the Egyptian government.
government to be the Americans. And so uh, even if these states wanted to provide some aid into Gaza, they will not be able to break the siege. The solution is the siege has to end before any of these acts of solidarity can be uh, can reach Gaza. One would think, given the, the dire of situation that we're in, there would be some degree of movement within the different Arab regimes. Is there any indication of any form of change, given the new situation? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that at the end of this pandemic, that this is a historical moment, and that this is an epoch-changing uh, pandemic, uh, both in the West and, and in the Third World. Um, at this moment, the Arab states have, you know, have, there's, there's no indication, but we're still at the beginning. We're still at the beginning of, of this pandemic. And certainly in the Third World, we're still at the beginning of the pandemic. We, you know, once this infection reaches those slums around New, uh, Mexico City or Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro or Cairo uh, or Manila. This is, where, this is when the real pandemic is going to happen. This is when we will see the, the devastating effect of this pandemic, not in Northern Italy and Germany and Switzerland. And that's the devastation that is going to... to uh, 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 this is where it's going to reach. This is when we'll stop hearing about it as a, as a heartbreaking story. You started off mentioning right at the very beginning that uh, the, it's not possible in places like Gaza to be able to go into the sort of social isolation that's been talked about at the moment in order to contain a pandemic of this size. To what extent, one of the people who co-hosting with Jammu Kashmir TV is uh, organizing in the age of uh, COVID-19, if you like, organizing and resisting at the moment. Those people who wish to show solidarity with Palestinians, especially in Gaza, what can they do, do you think, in the current situation? First of all, mobilizing politically uh, against the siege, particularly against the concept of siege in the time of pandemic, and the fact that this is a, a, a you know, this is not an, a war crime only. The siege is always a war crime. This is an aggravated war crime. And so mobilizing to basically make sure that the world sees this as a genocidal act. Sanctions as in the American sanctions against uh, Iran and Venezuela and Cuba in the time of a pandemic, or the siege uh, of Gaza, these are acts of genocide when they happen at the time of a, a, a pandemic like this, because you are intentionally, intentionally denying access to healthcare in a time of a pandemic in order to kill people. There is no other way this pandemic is going to play itself out. It's quite remarkable how whatever liberalism that existed within the Western regimes has been stripped of all its pretense to humanity. When I was with you in Beirut, you said that uh, pandemics are epoch changing. You know, we're not just in a moment where one particular process uh, changes. And I could perhaps move uh, on to a little more philosophical point and ask you, I, I looked at, uh, on your uh, Facebook page, and perhaps you could ex expand a little bit on this. In order for neoliberalism and late capitalism to have flourished, it needed to destroy all forms of solidarity between people, you said. It realizes that solidarity is critical to the survival, to surviving this uh, pandemic. Therein lies the crisis. What do you mean? So yesterday there was a surreal, surreal uh, uh, moment on TV when Governor Cuomo of, of the state of New York, in all honesty, was dis rediscovering the wheel. So this man was in front of TV talking about what 
the rest of humanity knew a long time ago. He said that he believed that the private hospitals in uh, uh, in New York State had to be linked to a system that was a public health system to, in order to, to be able to uh, treat patients in this pandemic. That he believed that the state needed to become the sole uh, uh, purchaser of medical equipment to try to uh, 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 stop the the uh, companies that make this these equipment from profiteering. So basic, basic, uh, infer basic conclusions that the rest of humanity had already uh, figured out a long time ago is now being realized at the heart of the most barbaric economic system, which is the United States. And this is the issue that we are facing. If you, as a philosophy of government and a philosophy of an economic system, do not believe that individuals, uh, that collective salvation of individuals is the only way uh, for individual salvations, i.e. that if we are going to survive, we have to survive together, then you cannot fight an epidemic. You cannot fight an epidemic based on uh, individual survival. If you do not believe that is the most productive form of human relations and not competition, then you cannot survive this epidemic. If you do not believe that uh, um, solidarity, which is the relationship of kinship between human beings that is not preconditioned on profit or on identity politics, solidarity as a human act between two people, that if you do not believe in solidarity, both between individuals, between uh, sectors of society and between states, then there's no way we are going to survive this epidemic. All of these are the philosophical tenets of late capitalism and neoliberalism, which is the social discourse of late capitalism. Perhaps we could they even... They have now come around. No, carry on, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say that perhaps it is uh, the current crisis it can't really be separated by the crisis within capitalism. It comes at a particular moment in history, does it not? It didn't happen five years ago. It happens now. We're in the midst of wars. I forget how many wars I have to follow every morning when I wake up just to keep a tally of my friends and uh, close uh, uh, colleagues. So in a way, to what extent is even the pandemic itself a product of the new modes of capitalist development of food, of agriculture and consumption, let alone the, 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 the travel and the whole international network? So in a sense, to what extent is it clear, clear that this is a problem of society and not necessarily a clinical one? There are two parts to the answer. One is the generation of the, of the pandemic. Uh, uh, and the generation of the pandemic has come about as a result of industrialization of food production, has come about the creation of uh, mega cities, has come about uh, 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 as a result of these massive uh, airport hubs that connect multiple continents to each other. And then there is the, the inability to properly deal with it, which is how can you deal with an epidemic in an age where you have managed to consistently commodify human health? The commodification of human health means that you are unable or you have given up the tools by which you can treat a, 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 a uh, and stop this infection and treat the infection in a meaningful way because you have set up a health structure that has nothing to do with human health. It views it as a commodity that you can add surplus value to and sell and buy. And that commodity 
yes. If your health system is built on the commodification of human health, the profit is in the treatment of illness, not the uh, uh, creation of health. It's a, a lot there to think about, Hassan, but one thing for sure, that the commodity itself, which the commodity culture that creates a pandemic, isn't going to give us a moment, a movement of solidarity. So if we go back a little bit to the situation in Gaza, and I was wondering, what do we do? People cannot not do anything. Some structure has to develop within uh, whereby those who are concerned about the possible long-term implications not just in palestine but for humanity of the policies being carried out by the israelis what sort of structures of solidarity can we begin to develop internationally to as the thing unfolds i think solidarity itself as an act has to return as the basis of relationships between peoples. I mean, what has happened with the destruction of the solidarity movements of the 50s and 60s has been its replacement by aid. Uh, and therefore, and aid has gotten us to this point. Therefore, what we need to do is rebuild the concept of solidarity as the only viable relationship between uh, human beings. And only through that are you able to rebuild relationships of trust, of mutual benefit, of uh, understanding that, that constitute solidarity. I think that's a, a, a nice place to maybe round up for today. But as we round up, you know, we've got a prime minister who is uh, in England who now is, uh, uh, people say he's in self-isolation, but we don't quite know. And uh, what would you say from your the position of, uh, of Palestinians, what would you say to the Briti Brits and the Americans in terms of the way that they've helped to create a situation which we find ourselves in now? The, the mode of government that has created the imperialist structure that the Palestinians have been the victims of has now come back to ruin the lives of British citizens and US citizens in the same callous way as it has ruined the lives of peoples in the third world. That moral a uh, uh, vacuum that lied that lies at the heart of government eventually has now returned home and will try to find scapegoats in the form of the elderly or the weak to try to uh, uh, justify sacrificing them to try to get out of this uh, crisis like it justifies the uh, uh, annihilation of uh, whole nations to try to get out of previous capitalist crises. On oh, no, a final note, uh, and, and is unless you have something that you feel has been left out, Hassan. On a final note, really, there is a an air of hopelessness and helplessness amongst people. Certainly, when you talk to anybody, it's doom and gloom. What should we look forward to? We look forward to the fact that we now are suddenly talking about uh, forms of human re uh, relations that have been jettisoned, uh, like solidarity. We now talk about, again, uh, co cooperation as an active form of and not competition. We talk about the, the uh, genocidal uh, policies affecting both peoples in the uh, nor northern hemisphere as they do in the southern hemisphere. We talk about the fact that unless we end the commodification of human health, we will uh, 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 find ourselves again and again in situations where we decide which groups 
to uh, save and which groups to throw under the bus, as is happening in Europe at the moment and the United States. Thank you, Ghassan. Thank you very much. And uh, thank, you. thank you very much, all of you who've given your valuable time to look at us. And I think the most important thing to take away is to help and assist in lifting the siege of Gaza for all human beings to be treated as equals. We're in it together. You can't live like we used to do in the past. Let us not give up hope and continue to continue resisting for a better future. Thank you.